And as Google started, we're all doing this with commodity hardware here. So also the recording. So, okay, so please uh, give a warm welcome to. So hi and welcome. So I didn't prepare a one hour talk, so it will probably be about 30, 35 minutes. So we will catch up a bit on schedule. Um, I'm talking a bit about a foreign ecosystem, so I will like, explain a bit more what I mean with foreign, but um, we're the PyData meetup, so there's a lot of things outside. Um, from, for me, about myself, I'm working since lately at Kvantko, which is a data science um, consultancy project company where we're working on long-time projects with customers spread out about across Europe and the US. Um, my main open source contributions are in the Apache Aaron, Apache Parquet project. Um, both, uh, if you do a big, a lot of big, big data things, or you read Hacker News, you've probably heard of them. Um, but often people don't have an idea what these projects actually are about. Uh, in my work, I work mostly with Python, but I'm always interfacing with other languages because there's not only Python in the company, but there are like other data science languages like R, or a lot of systems are written in Java, which are meant for like um, custom relationship systems what you have to connect to to data science. Um, important thing, there's my Twitter and GitHub handle. Follow me on Twitter if you want to get the slides later on. <laughs> there will be no link just on my Twitter account. Um, where Python, Python meet up, so it's about Python. People often argue or fight about if you should use Python or if you should use R, but in the end, um, it shouldn't actually be about fighting um, which of these two you should use, but as you should think of can you use Python, can you use R? Each of them have, have their benefits, like one is maybe more suited to statistics known people, the other one is where you can do more general purpose things. And in the end, you just don't only want to argue and use both of them, but you actually want to use a whole slew of programming languages because your colleagues just don't work in Python and they don't want to work in Python because they're doing network administration, they're doing customer relationship programs, and so on. So, to get the data from them, you have to talk with them. And that brings us to the thing, when I think of Python, I can work every, in everything in Python, but um, there's really a problem because that's not just me, there are also other people. And the problem comes from there that we have different ecosystems, they're often in their own kind of like conference fields, so like we're now at a PyData meetup where people are thinking about Python, they're, they're, doing maybe some kind of R, they're using pandas, using NumPy, and when they're talking about Spark, they're using PySpark or Sparkler, and things that people are concentrated about Docker containers. But uh, two weeks ago, I gave a similar talk, slightly adapted here to the communities, at Berlin Buzzwords, and in Berlin Buzzwords, people think about, they want to code in Scala, they want to code in, in Java, there's not really anyone to, taking you seriously if you're saying I'm working full-time with Python. <laughs> And uh, the people there are concerned about scaling things with Flink or Elasticsearch, and everyone who's using Spark over there is using Scala. No one takes you seriously if you say PySpark, and they're like, okay, you're crazy, you're just doing toy examples. And there's another third community people often forget, which is a huge one, is that you have SQL-based databases. And like, there are the, the main talks is you have JDBC, ODBC access, or another custom protocol, like the Postgres protocol is turning out like an industry standard. But there you see three different communities. Typically, if you're in a company, which is kind of bigger, all those three exist. And people often, they're like in their silos, not talking to each other. But in the end, um, we have a problem that we need to solve because when we want to do some kind of data science, we want to build data pipelines or make an end-to-end -end data product, we need to connect all three of those. And probably even more like C sharp main administration systems. So we need to connect them. Uh, typically, we write something in Java, we copy it then in another language so we can simulate what's going on there. And also, taking two systems, connecting to each other, always means you need to write a converter. And there's probably another company using the same ERP system with some other data science stack, then they will write another converter, which is slightly different. And you get into a space where you're writing a lot of converters, trying to get them fast, probably mostly you're just happy with them working. And not fast, but just get the data out of there. And also, 
the base discussion is always we have Python, we have R, we have one prefers the other one. And if you have multiple teams working together, one is a Python team, one is an R team, you still want that they can exchange their tools and are not about just, yeah, we keep everything in Python or we keep everything in R and you just lose. So in the end, we have maybe an ecosystem where you have like on the top, like the systems you use to compute things on your data and on the bottom you have the systems where your data are stored. And I'm working in the Apache Arrow project and that's kind of one of those proposed solutions which you can use as an intermediary thing. So Apache Arrow is always, uh, it's a big open source project and it's always sold as like bringing everything, uh, solving all those connection problems um, magically. Um, a lot of those Hacker News articles just don't go in depth. So when I talk to people about Apache Arrow, they're, they're thinking it's kind of magic, but they don't understand what it's doing. Um, also, the main thing is that as an end user, you will not see this. So it's kind of good to know that it's there. It will hopefully solve things. That is not magic. Um, but Apache Arrow is an open source project which has the core idea that it's taking, um, just de defining a standard data structure for columnar data or table data. Um, if you know what a data frame is, it defines a memory structure that how a data frame should look like in memory so that if you have different systems, that all of these systems have a common denominator where they communicate with. And this just defining data structure is kind of boring and people will not use it because a data structure is something which is easily defined. So in the Apache Arrow project, we also bring you um, code that you can actually access this data structure, not just in Python, but in a huge set of languages. Um, and we also make sure that in each language it's the same data structure. So if you have memory in a Python program and you have a C Sharp program, that you can just reference the same memory, not, not even copy it, but reference the same memory and keep working on that. And we also build building blocks around that, that if you have an existing system, that you can connect this existing system to another system, or that you have adapters. Now, the first main thing is, if you read a sentence about what Apache Arrow is, it's a common columnar representation. Columnar is always a fancy thing, but you first understand why you need it if you look at how to structure your data for your CPU. Like, our main use case is that we have a table, uh, we can store it in a database. Um, it's a 2D structure, but in the end, our memory in our computers is just 1D, so we have to decide on how do we map this 2D structure to 1D elements. And there are typical, there are just two obvious layouts. It's like, row, pick a, pick a row and each value one after another which is the traditional layout here, to, which is like for most databases, MySQL and Postgres store your data on disk, which is really useful if you're running a website and you have a table of blog entries. And if, when you want to, want to access this table, you want to know the title of the blog, the content of the blog, the author of the blog, and your main interest is just in all values of this one row. So putting them all together at the same place is just the obvious choice. And in data science analytics, you normally, are more interested in working on one column at a time. Like, I look at the price column. Please give me the average price, give me the maximum price, and so on. Then you just, all your tasks are just based on getting those values from this one column. And then interleaving each column with um, each value of, like, you're taking the session ID and have, having all those values in between from the other columns until you access the next value of that column is not so beneficial because the CPUs are optimized that you can always fetch chunks of memory and work on chunks of memory. So if, there's, if there are values in between, you're just wasting your bandwidth. And that's why you, in analytics, prefer columnar data. Now, connecting data systems um, together with kind of the standard, there are already solutions. But these solutions, they have some kind of unfortunate effects. Like, everyone knows that in every system you can import, export CSV files, and CSV files always work, and they even sometimes really fast because everyone knows people will export CSV files, so they invest a lot of time in making CSV fast. But in the end, CSV is human readable. That means also it's not so good machine readable. Um, in the end, that makes it also slow. It could be a lot faster, and it's row-wise, so it's not actually matching that how we want to represent data in memory. 
There is parquet files, which is the typical thing if you use Spark on another big data system, um, which where you have column data on disk, and you can load that in also in a lot of other systems. So nowadays, like everything that's supporting data analytics will have a, a parquet support. And even older systems like SAS are now also adding um, parquet support so you can read those files. So you're quite safe nowadays also with using parquet as the base format. But the thing it's a file format, it's main focus is on getting data fast to disk. So it serializes and compresses the data in a fast way, but it's still making modifications to your data. And making modifications to data means it takes time. So passing data between two systems, and even if you do this quite often, is really costly again. And sometimes you just think, yeah, memory access is fast, so copying data is okay. Serializing it takes a bit more, but it may be fast. But in the end, 10 gigabyte per second is the rate you have on a laptop. Sounds fast if you maybe only have a, like one gigabyte data set, but if you copy that quite often between two systems, um, this adds up. So even if your data set is 100 megabytes, copying it 100 times, which is a typical thing that can happen if you swi switch between two systems, it takes some time. Um, so this, this, this is actually is a number which lo looks really fast, but if you just experience this in, in, in a real world example, you will get really not, um, you will really feel that. So it's kind of pain always to explain. <coughs> and the also thing, Data frame is a typical data structure. You get an R, you have a data frame, and Pandas gives you a data frame, and Spark also has its own data frame implementation. They're all quite similar. In the background, everything is totally different implemented, and there are always kind of nuances like how are nulls handled, how is a string type represented in memory, and so on. They're quite different. So if you want to implement an algorithm, you can implement it for one of those trees but you can't reuse the implementation for another data frame implementation. You have to start from scratch again because there's a lot of things different. Um, for that, in Arrow, we have like distinct separate implementations for different languages um, of our memory format um, so that if you're working in Java, you can load Arrow memory in Java and don't have any dependencies on the C++ library. Um, the same thing goes if you're working in C++, you don't have any dependency of Java. But if you, if you work with those two together, we also have tests that you can pass it just around. And passing data around here just means giving you the reference to the thing in memory, not copying data. And a lot of languages is nice to have, but the thing is always, um, you're not just talking here about having two program languages, you um, talking about bringing communities together. That's an important aspect I learned in this project because normally you you always talk with like-minded, totally like-minded people in a, in a open source project, like everyone in Pandas is using Python. So you have kind of common thing there. But if you're working in, working in Arrow, it's not kind of like that thing. You have people working in Java, doing data engineering or data ingestion, and you have people in Python that just care about machine learning in the end. So they have totally different interests, they need to talk together because management said, yeah, you have, we have this big data set, we have this machine learning guy, so do some use case on that. So you always have to be like, um, get people talking, find like common wording, so people actually understand what the other one wants to do, and yeah, get some social interaction. And having just data structures is probably boring, it's probably nothing end users will use, so um, having something on top which makes this usable is quite, quite important. And the main feature of Apache Arrow uh, from the Python world is we provide a really fast parquet reader. Um, so if you're using Pandas and you have a colleague having processing big data sets in Spark, writing them out, um, you normally use PyArrow to use, read these parquet files and get them into Python. That's like 80% what our users do. And there are other cool things which are coming just now up. It's like there's Gandiva, which gives you really fast um, expressions with, that are just, just in time compiled, meaning you can write complex expressions in Python, um, and then there's a just in time compiler that can map that to filters, and these filters can be, uh, will be live compiled to what your CPU supports, which is just getting the last bit of, out of CPU performance, and can filter on arrow structures, which can also push down into packet files. And getting more like, we have now 
because you don't only work on one machine, but you often have the use case that you send big chunks of data around over a network protocol, which needs some things like remote procedure calling and authentication. So we extended um, gRPC from Google with some mechanics so you can send chunks of data frames over network, but um, with some special hooks that it, if you receive the data in this like framework implementation, you get a re reference to the data in the network and don't actually copy it. Because normally network protocols will, will be fast, will have low latency, but they have small amounts of data, so they don't care about copying data two or three times. But when you get large chunks of data, copying it two or three times means you need a two or three times bigger instance, which is always a bit annoying. And the most interesting things for users normally arrow is backend technology powering things. And so as an end user, like probably like 95% here in the room, you will not use Arrow in the end, but you will use a system that is based on Arrow and that's made fast by Arrow. Um, nowadays, um, NVIDIA is pushing data frames on, CPU, uh, on GPUs, um, which is basically built up on Arrow so that they have a data frame implementation which can pull data from CPU memory into the GPU um, without any transformations. And the other popular thing is if you use Spark, there since version 2.3, there's a pandas UDF function in there, which gives you the ability to write fast aggregation functions with Python or just fast modification functions. Before that, you had a lot of serialization going on because Python code in Spark is always um, executed in a separate process from the actual Spark process. And we're using that now for, for Python and for R so that you get really fast execution data that you don't have to fall back to Scala if you want to write custom things. And there's also like things like for me, my, my first or my second use case after parquet reading was I have a database which comes in this ODBC protocol. Everything there is optimized for latency. So um, just giving you results from a query really fast, but only with just one data point coming out. But if you're doing data science machine learning, you just want all data. So you get really big chunks of data. And that wasn't really fast in there. So I wrote together with a colleague, we wrote an adapter that you can access <coughs> databases which follow the ODBC standard and get the data back as pandas data frames or as error tables in this case and then convert it to a pandas data frame so that if there's a big result set, that it's really fast. And the other thing which brings two talks together like this evening is that uh, another have a user of Apache Arrow where you also don't see Apache Arrow uh, as an end user is Katotek there. Um, Florian will talk about what it's really doing in there, but things to keep in mind, Katotek is a heavy user of the Paquet Reader. And also, if you did that with Pandas data frames, you know that a lot of things like strings and sometimes even if you hack around with nullable ints until the latest version, there will be object columns. So there's no real Pandas type, but it's just type object. So um, the pandas, data, pandas type system is quite small, quite limited, and if you want to work with like structured or string data, it don't, doesn't give you a real type. And there are also some other components in Arrow which we could use in Katotake or which we use in Katotake, which are available in Arrow in other languages. So if someone would do another Katotake implementation in like Scala, they could use these components. Um, but now I just told you about an open source artifact which you may or may not know. Um, and if you know it, you probably just know it from like buzzwords articles. And I've showed you some slides, so the main question is does it really actually work? Because things on slides is pretty, but uh, you don't know how, if something really works or if something really promises what it does until you actually just um, see it working. So I'm taking a real life example which buffered me a bit. You have an ERP system, which is written in Java, and the vendor's also saying, okay, cool, system, everyone in ERP world is doing Java, so we don't need to provide a non-Java client, but just be standard conform. Here's a JDBC client you can use, so you don't have to write a custom client for us. But for me, as a Python user, uh, I want to write my pipelines in, in Python. I want to do the data cleaning in Python, so I don't want to deal with a Java system because that's not the world I'm normally working in. And in the end, I have business analytics people at the end who want to use my cleanup data set. 
uh, and they're working in R. Um, the main problem in the end is then this, this can be run like, like hopping from one to another, like a, a, when we're working on the, the Java, people can give me a data export, I can work on the data export then, I do analysis and so on, and the R people can take a data export from Python again and work on that. But when you want to take this live, um, and doing like small batches in the live system, you, t you can't do just data exports and on and on, because that will be really slow. So we actually want to have this in one process, and that's the, the really good thing about Arrow, you can connect all these three languages, all these three runtimes run in one single um, process, and you don't even need to copy the data between Java and Python, but you can just work on the result. Um, in that simple example, we have in our Java library an adapter which can talk to a JDBC client. The JDBC client um, um, gives you a result set and JDBC result set in Java, and there is a nice package called Chipe, which gives you the ability to call Java functions from Python in the same process. And then this Py Java code um, uses typical Java just-in-time compiling to give me um, a fast access, a fast conversion from this JDBC result set to an error structure. Then I have my uh, formally result set in a nice columnar data structure, which is just like a data frame. And I have a magic function in Arrow, which is called PyArrow JVM record batch, which basically takes a Java table and take, looks inside of that and actually just pulls out a memory pointer and keeps a reference to the memory structure in Java so that it doesn't get garbage collected and puts this memory pointer into the same Python structure. And then I have a Python structure referencing the memory coming out of Java and I can just use this structure to get a pandas data frame out of that and work on the, with the pandas data frame on the Java data uh, without copying that. In my case, it's just two, two or three columns, but if you have a really big data set and it's coming from Java, you don't want to have it copied. We'll have maybe copies already when you do any modifications on that data frame, but you can work with that. And the nice thing is when you're now stepping onto R, there's the package called Reticulate, which you can use to call Python code. And you can, can, can just use this package, call the Python code I just written there for my JDBC access with some data cleaning on, on top. And I get a Python pi arrow table back. And there is a reticulate has a pi to r function, which you can use to take a, a reference po a pointer from, from an object from Python and transform it to a native R um, structure. And we have like this record batch function I had in Python, which takes the memory pointer. We also have that in R, which is magically called when you call this pi to r function, and gives you then an R arrow data frame, which then just looks like a native R um, object and has no Python in it anymore, but still references the same data. And you can just use that and look at a, at a table with, with an R data frame. And there was after JDBC client, there was no copy involved in that code, so that's really nice and you can pass on data from one system to another. Um, with one remark, um, this is only working in the next Arrow version, so the first example is working since quite a while. This one is just a preview. Um, but that's the main idea. I think not many people are using now the ability to, to pass data from Java to Python to R in one process. Um, so the real use case or usage, if you're a Python user, if you want to see this, this working, that you have a common data structure with, which gets you rid of like writing adapter code, is that you actually will use pandas, and in pandas you will use read and read parquet or two parquet, um, and in the back end arrow is there for you, which powers um, the parquet reader, which is the same exact same code if you do a two parquet or from parquet in R. And also, you can use TurboDBC to connect to a database which has an ODBC driver, like MySQL or so, and get your results back in Py as a pandas data frame a lot faster than if you use the built-in pandas.readsql function. Um, both cases, normally speed ups are like, like in the times of one, 100 times faster, so it's really significant. And 
being a bit, comp bit um, large project or a really big feed where you can work on things. Um, the main things that are coming up in the project in Arrow is, as, especially on my side, is um, when you have a common data structure, you actually want people to use it or you want to use the power that you have one data structure with, which connects a lot of things. You want to connect it to even more things so that if you come up with a new system, you don't have to write an adapter code to all like 10 systems you're already connecting to, but you just want it's one connector to Arrow and all your other systems have Arrow connections on. Um, for me nowadays, I'm having, I'm facing now some Postgres instances. Postgres drivers in Python are cache fast, but if I get a big result set back, it takes quite some time to get a result in the data frame. So get, writing more adapters, like taking Postgres results, getting your da directly data frame back, it's one of those new things which we would like to have in Arrow. The other things we, we're building in Arrow nowadays is that we also support a bit more that people have data sets, like huge collections of bad files, and with some library on top that maybe manages them, but we also want to provide um, like the, the building blocks for these libraries can use in many languages that they can load these data sets and have the data structure and memory without actually taking care of the management of the number of files. And also, I mentioned that there are at least three known data frame implementations that are totally distinct. Um, providing a memory structure where you can build up data frame impl implementations on top is just halfway. Uh, Wes McKinney is always talking about Pandas 2.0. Um, probably not happening immediately, but um, one of the building blocks of Pandas 2.0 will be Arrow, so that you can then use um, the Arrow structures, taking data from other systems, and also having just a, a big, uh, a good um, basis for building a new data frame implementation so that algorithms written for that Python data frame can also maybe be used for the R data frame, which could be also built on top of that. So that if you implement a really complex algorithm in C++, which is really fast, you don't need to take care of implementing one version for Python and one version for R, but just can use the one version for both of them. Yeah. That was my basic overview. about what is Arrow, and I hope you all got now a basic understanding if you're reading an Arrow article the next time um, telling you that it's some magic doing columnar systems faster and you actually get an understanding about what is this magic and why you aren't seeing that directly in your program. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. Uh, my no, um, there will be maybe as an half of uh, extension on top, but the main thing about Arrow is that it's defining how the structure is looking. We provide some algorithms that can modify the, the data, but we don't actually provide um, the processing, the actual processing framework on top. That's a thing that's more like things which Pandas or Spark are doing. Um, arrows more the backing of how the memory is stored. Yeah. So I was a little sad when I uh, when I first saw the start for the trees of an arrow and the pandas looked like the yes, it's done. So I checked it out and I found out it was quite slow, much slower than the serialization in many cases. Um, well, we have to talk about why. <laughs> So I'm, I'm not a 100% Spark expert, so I can't tell you why it's slower. Um, it should normally be at least as fast as the no, non-Pandas UDF way. So, so I think I'm a bit of a conventional. Yeah. And then the second question I have, um, so a common theme I think around the question is, whenever I go to Pandas and Python on Pi's R, then it's the point where the SQL like data declarations uh, are not good enough anymore. So I want to iterate about data frames like row by row. And then I feel stuck with Python somehow because this is slow and Python is slow access is slow as hell, so I have to convert to Git or stuff. So is my question is, is error or is some part of error ecosystem offering a solution where I can then do the actual iteration over rows and run common operations in the right way? Because also this is something which feels to my students and that must be necessary from time to time. No, the, the actual focus is here really on working columnar side. So if, if you stay in Python, um, row by row won't be fast because it's just the one main constraint for optimization that we want to make column operations fast. So this row by row won't help you here. 
you can use libraries like number or so if you go over row by row with for loops, but um, that's not a thing what error is doing. Error is providing you just the backing memory on top. If Gandiva is ever exposed to Python in a proper fashion, this might stop. No, that's still common operations. So if you if you have a row by row use case, no. Only if you if you at the end if you would work with a pandas data frame and a pandas data frame would be efficient for you, then arrow is a good thing if, if you need something to communicate with other systems. Yeah. Uh, just a, a curiosity. Um, if I understood correctly, you can pass the memory from one language to another, get the, the address of the memory. How would you do it in practice? In practice, we um, we really just use the, 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 the address in the memory and read them the value of the, the, the yeah, integer. The from one, let's say the point Java from the other one is In this case here, this library type is starting for us a JVM in the background. And as it's running the same process, it's also running in the same um, address space. And we can just ask the, the Java data structure, uh, what, is your, what is the memory address of your column data? It will give you then the memory address and we can just construct a Python object which references the same memory address. So it's really just an integer passing around. Which also you have to take care of if you pass that, pass that integer around, you also need to take care of that you don't destroy um, the object that's holding on to this memory. Because in Java, if an object is deleted or is not longer referenced, Java system is open to just destroy it any time. So if, it's, if the object holding the error memory is just destroyed and you don't have a reference to that, your, your backing structure is destroyed. Yeah. Yeah. Are you synchronizing access to the shared uh, memory locations? Um, no, because um, in arrow definition, every column is immutable. So if you do any mutations, you have to allocate a write to new memory. Yeah. Does this also work with Py4j? No, Py4j doesn't work with that because Py4j is starting um, a Java runtime in another process. So you don't have the same address space. So the, in the Py4j case, if you get an integer address, um, it's only usable in the, in the Java process. So in Py4, that's the that's Scala case. In Scala you have used Py4j, you have, uh, in, in Spark, you have the main Scala process which has memory, and if you use these pandas UDFs, you, um, it just copies the data from Scala to the Python process, which is a single copy. If you don't use the, the pandas UDF, it serializes the data to, um, to another row row format and converts that sends it over to Python, and Python uses another slow approach to deserialize it. But it's just two distinct processes, so you have to copy. Yeah. Across platform, it, you mean between different operating systems? Yeah, yeah but yeah, that works, but you still have a copy then that. Yeah, but that's okay if you that's like for the flight RPC case where you copy between two hosts. Yeah, yeah, it works on Linux, Windows, or Mac, and we test on there. So the main limitation at the moment is that you have to have a little Indian system, which means that you can't use old PlayStations. Um, but it also works if you have a Windows laptop and you have a Raspberry Pi which is not running um, Intel CPUs. You can use the same memory and just copy it over. That's also the main thing. GPUs have also kind of bit different architecture. And you can, that's why these uh, GPU data frames work also. Yeah. Um, one question, uh, can you maybe elaborate on, on the cases when you need to serialize the data and when you can access it directly? The, the, the main use case of Arrow is that you don't serialize at all. Um, so that's the, the selling point that you have one memory structure that's supported in all our runtimes. Um, you need to serialize if you Right, if you use something else, like Paquet is the typical example because it's quite similar to Arrow, but um, it's a file format that's also taking care of size. So it, um, it takes column by column um, the data, tries to make simple en encoding techniques, 
to use not so much CPU because it knows which is the type of the data and then uses compression on top of the encoded data. There you have the benefit, it has smaller size um, and if you send it over a slower network, um, it's faster than, uh, it's faster to spend the CPU time and then send it over a network than just copying the data plane to a network. Thank you very much for coming. Bye. Bye.